Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Professor Andres Vilindovsky, Head of School of Mathematics and Physics. And I welcome uh, you all in our uh, first physics talk uh, in uh, Lincoln Math and Physics Week uh, uh, 2021. Uh, this is the uh, first time uh, <clears throat> our school uh, uh, participates in uh, British Science Week and we organized uh, uh, 12 lectures, 6 in math, 6 in physics. Uh, and I just before I start, a uh, couple of uh, uh, announcements. If you happen to hear a uh, fire alarm, you need to follow instructions uh, of your own house. Uh, uh, the talk will be live. Uh, and at any time during talk, you can post a question in the chat of uh, YouTube, as uh, many of you are doing now, saying hello to each other. Also, uh, when you registered, uh, uh, if you registered on Eventbrite, uh, you received today several times reminder, we, uh, which inside had also a link uh, to so-called Padlet. Uh, uh, which uh, provides you opportunity to ask a question anonymously without any login, without any email, uh, just a click on that link and, uh, and type your question in, or you can type in live chat. Uh, uh, after uh, talk is uh, finished, uh, these questions, uh, I will scroll through the charts and uh, ask question to our speaker. Uh, before uh, we uh, go to uh, to the talk, uh, I'll say a few words about uh, about our school and those who came already to a talk in mathematics one hour before. Apologies, you will listen something uh, uh, for the second time. Uh, however, uh, those who uh, did not uh, came to the previous talk, for them it will be first time. So, if you will uh, hear something uh, twice, uh, apologies for that, uh, but it will be uh, uh, rather short. Let's uh, wait a second, then uh, file is loading. So again, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Professor Andres Vilendovsky, Head of School of Mathematics uh, and Physics here in Lincoln, and we are hosting uh, our first Lincoln Mass and Physics Week 2021. Uh, traditionally, uh, you would come to our events in our beautiful campus uh, on the waterfront uh, of the uh, city of Lincoln. Uh, this time it's all virtual, however we hope uh, one day uh, after the pandemic is over, you can come here uh, and visit our uh, campus and city uh, in person. Uh, it's a beautiful campus, but also very beautiful small city of about 100,000 inhabitants. Uh, but also very old city, uh, already found uh, uh, shortly after Romans came in, into the British Isles, it was a home of famous uh, Ninth Legion uh, uh, and uh, received a prestigious uh, uh, status of Colonia uh, already in times of Emperor uh, Domitian. Uh, uh, it was uh, city for retired legionaries uh, and some uh, Roman heritage you can still enjoy if you come today. You can walk uh, under the Roman arch, for instance. Next, uh, a big step in development of the uh, city of Lincoln was uh, when um, next uh, uh, arrival was uh, of uh, William the, uh, the Conqueror, uh, and uh, Lincoln got its famous castle, and opposite to castle was built uh, uh, even more famous Lincoln Cathedral, uh, which once uh, uh, 
uh, been for uh, quite substantial peri uh, period of time the tallest building on earth. Uh, but not only the tallest, in fact, it's uh, probably one of the most beautiful buildings, uh, uh, as cathedral buildings in, in Britain and uh, elsewhere. Uh, as uh, uh, a cathedral was here that was a seat of learning from, uh, from Middle Ages, uh, but university was found only in 20th century. In 1996, uh, a beautiful campus appeared on the waterfront, uh, uh, and uh, uh, much more recently, uh, that campus uh, was joined by a new school of mathematics and physics, uh, opened in uh, 2014, and we've got our own uh, building shared with School of Engineering and Computer Science, uh, named after Isaac Newton, who also was from the area of Lincolnshire. And that building will be uh, just four years in one month. Uh, our lectures, uh, uh, they are aimed uh, on everyone who is interested in math and physics, but especially for those uh, who uh, study uh, those subjects uh, at school and might think uh, uh, in continuing studying mathematics or physics in the future. And therefore, I also mentioned that uh, what degrees uh, uh, we have <clears throat> in, our, uh, in our school here, uh, if, if somebody would like to, um, to continue study. Uh, we have, uh, uh, as a school of math and physics, we have both math and physics, and this, to uh, this talk is about physics, so I mentioned we have a full range, we have a bachelor uh, degree in physics and integrated master degree in physics. Uh, we have a joint uh, of physics with another ancient uh, uh, <clears throat> discipline, philosophy, uh, also as bachelor and master, and we have a joint uh, mathematics and physics, uh, which is an example like a theoretical physics is. So then you listen to our talks, uh, uh, you can also think uh, uh, and visit us again and, um, and see how you like it and maybe even come and study with us here. And with that, I'll... Um, invite uh, our uh, speaker of tonight. Which is uh, uh, David Wilkinson. Hello. Hello. And I won't say very much about David. I just say that David, uh, our um, senior visiting fellow here in School of Mathematics and Physics in Lincoln, but also he works for uh, the Institute of Physics, which is uh, the learning society uh, for uh, the United Kingdom and for Republic of Ireland. Uh, or we've seen for over the hundred years uh, development of physics uh, in, uh, in these two countries, in fact. Uh, I, why I won't say much about uh, David myself, because in fact, David has a talk uh, about half-life in physics, and he will say himself about uh, himself. Welcome, David. Thank you very much, Andre. Uh, I'm wearing an Institute of Physics shirt. I'm sure you can all uh, tell I'm on brand. Uh, forgive my fish if they tap on the glass. They uh, tap on the glass at about five o'clock to remind me it's time to feed them. Uh, so um, I'm really impressed that a load of you want to hear about um, a career in physics at uh, five o'clock on a Friday afternoon. That's absolutely brilliant. Hopefully that means that you're all uh, interested in this kind of thing. So I'm just going to share my screen with you. Um, Hopefully that now works. Um, so uh, I've called it a half-life in physics because I love making physics jokes. Like um, a man walks into a bar and says, what's new? And uh, they say E over H. Uh, so anyway, uh, sorry about that. So a half-life in physics. Um, I'm going to talk about how I started out in physics, what I've done in the meantime, and where I've got to now, because uh, I'm now 43 years old, goodness me. Uh, so that puts me about halfway through a physics career. And the thing I really want to show you is that 
um, a career in physics is not just one thing. Um, if you think it's just sitting down quietly, paying attention, writing down numbers, uh, there is a bit of that, but there's a whole load of other stuff as well. And um, the other thing is you don't just stay in one career. You can move across and backwards and forwards. And I'm going to show you how this one physics degree I did is relevant to lots of other things that I've done all the way through the career. So let's go back to the start. Um, I always wanted to be a doctor and I wanted to be nothing else at all. So from about the age of five right through to getting to university, all I ever wanted to do was be a doctor. Uh, I got into medical school in 1996 in Newcastle upon Tyne um, and I had a lifelong ambition to be in a hospital in a white coat. Um, you can probably see my white coat still up there and my uh, um, stethoscope. And I wanted to burst through a set of double doors in a hospital uh, and not be told to leave. And I managed to achieve that in March 1997. I think it was March 14th, 1997. I got to burst through that set of double doors. Unfortunately, by this time, I had discovered that I wanted to be not a doctor and pretty much anything else instead. So, uh, career change was on the cards. And after my first year at university, I managed to convert onto a degree in physics with medical applications. So uh, that is a core physics degree, but the optional modules were all hospital based. They were all things about medical equipment, about, you know, MRI scanners, x-rays and so on. And uh, I did my first piece of original research while I was a um, medical student there. And that was on something called anisotropy in brachytherapy. Now, <clears throat> you've probably not heard of that, but it's one of the most successful forms of cancer treatment. So if you want to carry out radiotherapy on uh, a cancer patient, the best thing you can possibly do is get some really heavy radioactive beads and insert them right into the middle of the tumour. Because normally we have to go in alpha rays, for example, you may have heard of alpha rays. They get, they're very powerful, they'll smash things up, but they get stopped by something the width of a piece of paper. So if we can get kind of more powerful um, radioactive um, rays coming out into the middle of the tumour, then we can irradiate that tumour and kill it without destroying a whole load of healthy tissue around it at the same time. So we can take this bead, insert it, say we've got a cancer here, you can insert it down somebody's um, neck into the middle of the cancer and irradiate it there. Now, this is really nasty stuff. So you need to figure out what the dose is before you start. Um, so you can actually go into other places as well. And the next picture is a little bit gruesome. So if you uh, don't like pictures of gruesome things, look away for just a moment. You can actually drill through tumours uh, so that you can get into them directly. Um, so on this occasion, we drilled into breast tissue. And then this diagram you see on the right is the amount of radiation dose that comes out of it. Now, the radiation dose you need to figure out before you start because you don't want people um, messing around with these radioactive pellets a lot because they are really vicious um, in terms of the radiation they put out. Those of you who are looking away, you can look back again now. Um, here we have, this is the um, actual uh, equation that tells you all the different factors that goes into working out those um, radioactive lines. And I won't go into a lot of detail, but basically my degree was trying to figure out how much of this equation you really need to figure out the anisotropy curve, because the um, computers at the time took a long time to crunch these numbers. And so it was trying to find out which ones were the most significant parts of that equation. Uh, and so we compare, I compared the computer simulations with something called a phantom. And just to show you, back in 1996, we were still hand drawing our diagrams. So uh, that's the uh, first bit I was doing. So I left, I graduated in physics with medical applications and went off to work for a government department. Um, now, government departments change their name about every six months or so. When I first got there, it was called the Police Scientific Development Branch, and then it became the Home Office Scientific Development Branch, and then it became the Centre for Applied Science and Technology, and now it's part of the Defence Science and Technology Laboratories. But I left it about 10 years ago, so uh, we're, not, we're not talking about um, the current name now. This is the site where it was. This is up on a hill in Hertfordshire and they had another site down in Sussex. And basically this is all things like bugging equipment and police uh, airport security and fingerprints. And um, in fact, that building there 
is where automatic number plate recognition was invented um, and so on. So this is kind of like a national resource for um, forensic science and for supporting the police and um, things like that. So what was I doing when I was there? The first uh, department I went into was to work on less lethal weapon systems. Now, back in 2001, when this was, the police had guns, they had dogs, they had truncheons, and they just started having CS spray as well. So they, that hadn't been around very long. Um, but for various reasons, the Human Rights Act and the peace process in Northern Ireland meant that we needed uh, more less lethal options for the police. You probably heard of them, things like baton round, tasers and so on. So back then, we discovered that nobody in the world had ever really figured out what a less lethal weapon really was. So in order to scientifically investigate things, remember this was a scientific investigation, uh, we needed some criteria to test against. So the first thing we did was to create the world's first operational requirement for less lethal weaponry. And there you can see 22 different things that we could actually start testing on. So this was the next four years of my life, basically, uh, was trying out different pieces of equipment on this. Here's some strange ideas that came through the door. Some things were known starters. We never really looked at them properly because there were big problems. For example, uh, a net entanglement system. So this is the kind of thing you see on superhero movies and stuff like that. So uh, the idea that you fire a net around somebody and it kind of wraps them up and they can't get out anymore. Unfortunately, that's that's not very good because uh, if you had an angry person with a knife who wanted to kill you and then you use this, you now have an angry person with a knife who wants to kill you in a net and you've not really solved your problem at that point because at some point you're going to have to get them out of the net. These weapons down here on the right are um, ray guns, essentially. So they uh, fire out microwave radiation to make the skin all hot in the hope that people don't want to be hot. But we were concerned about the kind of injuries those might do to people. And then down here, this is like sticky foam that you may have seen squirted into walls, holes in the wall or something like that. Um, and again, that was supposed to tangle you up so that you can go anywhere. And again, we thought this was really dangerous because if it got into your nose and mouth, obviously it would stop you breathing. Um, we were looking at water cannons. Now, these have never been deployed on the mainland UK, although they have been deployed in Northern Ireland. Uh, but some people wanted to uh, look at some alternative water cannons. And this, of course, if you've seen the advertising for this, is the famous picture um, of me. I'm not a ghostbuster. I'm holding a handheld water cannon. Um, it fires a slug of water out of the front of it. Um, and it uh, can only go about 10 metres. Um, that's a very heavy backpack on there. That comes to about 20 kilos. And uh, I'd forgotten my Newton physics the first time I fired it, because when I fired it, there is, of course, a every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So the enormous power of the water going out the front also meant that the gun fired backwards and I kind of fell over backwards with this big pack on. So that wasn't a particularly uh, great piece of equipment. Um, so my first project was distraction and disorientation devices. Uh, you may wonder what they are. It's basically light weapons. So the idea that you shine lights at people to um, uh, kind of temporarily blind them. Um, that we discovered fairly quickly using, again, my medical physics knowledge, the uh, knowledge that I gained at university about the kind of light that can go into the eye and what it does to the eye and things like that, I very soon said this is really dangerous and we're far too likely to blind people. So that was put away. Um, we also looked at sound weapons. Uh, so this is a directed acoustic device. This can actually send some sound waves in a direct line um, and it's very loud. Um, you can tell people to do things or you can increase it to the point where it becomes uncomfortable and stuff like that. So I was... <clears throat> starting to get interested in this particular piece of research. Um, but of course, 2001, this was my first year at work. And in September 2001, the world changed a bit. Um, in the world after 9-11, um, the emphasis became very much on to counterterrorism and things like that. And so certain departments uh, went looking for devices that would help in the war against terrorism. And so the directed sound stuff went off into a different department. And as just a little thing after that, I noticed it um, about 10 years later, um, the very same weapon was deployed for the Olympics. So it was there as a kind of denial device on the Thames. So 
having dropped that project, uh, I then went into something called electrical incapacitation devices. So there were new um, technologies coming online um, and one we didn't think we were going to use, but we needed to address it anyway, um, is something that you may have heard of um, called the taser. Now, some of you may know what this actually stands for. It actually stands for Thomas A. Swift's electric rifle. Um, the guy who invented the taser, um, Jack Cover, uh, was a physicist um, and he wrote it, in, uh, sorry, he invented it in the 1970s. But when he was a small boy in the 1930s, um, he used to read a book called Tom Swift and his electric rifle. And so that's what he named it after. So there are various features to it that we were having a look at. Um, different tasers. So we had to do lots of different, if you remember those 22 operational requirements, we did lots of experiments on the tasers. So we did things like drop them two meters onto a steel plate. We had a look to see if you could use them in darkness. We had a look to see how easy it was to change the uh, cartridge in the front of it. And we had all these police officers who you came in to try them out for us. And my favorite statistic from that is that 10% of the police officers managed to shock themselves during the handling trials. Um, so one of the uh, things we had to do, um, it's there is a laser sight on the front of it. And the American, um, it came from America and the all the um, paperwork that came with it didn't the laser safety didn't match British laser safety. So one of the things I had to do, and again, using my medical physics uh, thing, I went into a physics department and uh, basically I'd got a load of the laser sights out of these weapon systems and I had to try and crank up the voltage to see if it would ever become dangerous uh, to British uh, under the British laws. So here we are. I'm cranking up the voltage, and this is the amount of light coming out of the front of it, and this is where it would be dangerous. And as you can see, even when I put the voltage up to 35 volts, and the voltage inside these tasers at the, at the back end from the batteries is very low indeed. But the great thing is that three of them I managed to blow up, uh, so the uh, the lasers actually exploded uh, rather than going uh, becoming dangerous. Uh, another thing, safety, that we needed to so tasers pump out an electromagnetic wave and certain things in hospitals could be dangerous if they are interfered with by an electromagnetic wave. So we couldn't tackle everything in a hospital. So we found the things that we thought might be really dangerous to a patient if they went wrong. And then I got um, my head of finance to sign off an insurance document so that I could go into Luton and Dunstable Hospital and big thanks to them into their medical physics department where we set up all of these pieces of equipment, not connected to real people, obviously, but we actually set these up and then fired off tasers around them and into them and over them and things like that to find out if any of them uh, would be damaged. Um, another thing we did, so CS spray that I've already talked about, this is like a synthetic pepper spray, you've probably heard it described as that, is actually really flammable, uh, or rather the MIBK, methyl isobutyl ketone that it's, um, it's in, uh, is actually really flammable. And so uh, we did a load of testing on that to see if we could set it on fire. So there's a mannequin, but this is the actual mannequin that we used to fire at. That's inside a shed where we sprayed all the CS and everything like that. And there is a video of it. Unfortunately, I've not seen the video. I've not got the video. Um, but, you know, we're looking at somebody who might catch fire um, as a result. And again, just to make it clear, this is not a picture of somebody who has been CS and tasered. This is actually a stuntman called Jim Treller accepting a Lifetime Achievement Award um, from The Rock. Uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson on the left there. And I think Dwayne is doing very well, considering that he did not know Mr. Treller was going to set fire to himself to receive the award. Uh, so there's the actual uh, results. And we found out that, you know, if you CS somebody, you should not be tasering them afterwards. And so that's the kind of key information that the police need to know. So how to fit going back to the physiological basis for taser function, nobody probably tells you how they actually work. And again, this comes back to the medical physics that I was doing in the first place. So that is the kind of uh, signal that comes out of a taser. And that may be familiar to you if you've done any biology, uh, because nerve action potential, uh, so this is the actual electricity inside your nerves, you can see it's the same shape. And what the taser does is it mimics that electrical potential inside the nerves and tells all your muscles to contract. 
There's the electrical testing rig. So this is where I was actually finding out what those electrical signals were. And I've put this in because this was the only occasion I ever managed to accidentally taser myself. So I put my left hand on this taser here. This is the resistance that I was using. And we were going between 47 ohms and 4,700 ohms. And I had a really high resistance in there. And I put my right hand on the oscilloscope, my left hand on the taser. And it turns out my resistance was lower than the resistance I had in the circuit. And so I got to enjoy a full taser shot for five seconds. Um, so there's various parts in the body that we're interested, for example, in the brachial plexus. This is up in the arm. Um, and if your electrical signals get into one part of the nerves, you know, it shows you this kind of networking here that it can go to all kinds of different bits of, of your body. We everybody always asks me what's the effect upon the heart <clears throat> and pacemakers in particular. Tasers do stop, they do interfere with pacemakers, but only for as long as the tasers are being fired. As soon as they stop, the pacemaker goes back to normal um, function. Uh, and we can also multiply this by the fact that people with pacemakers very rarely get into violent situations with the police. Another thing uh, we did with DSTL is that we could current uh, model current flow inside the body. And so uh, we could actually, all that electrical uh, information that I was getting them, uh, so I found out where on the body it went, um, you know, where the barbs would hit, what the electrical signal was and everything like that. And we could put it into this electrical model and figure out how much electricity crosses the heart. And we found out that there was basically a 60 fold to 240 fold safety margin between what a taser produces and what a healthy heart would uh, stop with or rather have even have ectopic beats with. We never actually managed to get it to uh, fibrillate to actually stop the heart. So then after that, I moved into counter drugs technologies um, and I was the project manager for something called drugs investigation by low angle X-ray scatter. So we're all used to dogs looking for things like drugs and explosives and so on. And uh, dogs are quite good. We also discovered that bees were even better. You can actually train bees to sniff out uh, um, drugs and so on. Um, but I'll, that's a whole other lecture. I'm not going to go into that now. And the national standard is something called gas chromatography mass spectrometry. And that is the kind of thing that you're probably seeing in airports if you ever get swabbed, if we ever get to airports again. Um, that will be the kind of thing that they're using. But what about the fast parcel environment? So hundreds, if not thousands of parcels come into the UK every day, even now. And uh, how can we examine them all for drugs in them? And so we were using, we uh, again worked with University College London um, Medical Physics Department, St. Bartholomew's Hospital we worked with, which was in the news yesterday, um, and us worked together um, using a technique they were working on at the time. Um, you probably see it encountered this, actually. You may have heard of it. Um, if you fire x-rays into crystals of a certain length, they bounce out at such an angle and create one of these kind of patterns according to what that crystal is. Um, so they were using it to look for, uh, again, cancer in breast. This is breast tissue sample, and that's a cancerous region there. And there you can see it's become quite crystalline. And so they were using this method to look for the, uh, the cancerous cells in the tumours. So the basic setup is this. You've got your x-ray source here. Um, that's the sample. And then you have this uh, kind of big block of metal that takes away all the signal except for the scattered parts that we're interested in. So what does that look like in reality? Uh, it looks like that. Um, and so that's the system we were using. Now, here's a very rare sight. Here's a physicist wearing a white coat. We don't do it very often. Um, so if you ever see scientists in white coats, they're usually not physicists. But what I have there, uh, we need the samples for the, uh, the testing. Uh, so we needed different kinds of drugs. And uh, being as I work for the government, I was able to buy these drugs uh, legally and from um, proper um, industrial sites. So we got the actual pure drug itself. But of course, drugs on the street are mixed with all kinds of horrible stuff. So I would have to, that's me in there, basically mixing the drugs with all the horrible things you find on the street, like ground up glass and rat poison and things like that. So <laughs> very unpleasant stuff. And one of many, many reasons it's probably not a good idea to take drugs. Um, and so how did we do? Uh, there are the different spectra of the two kinds of heroin, the cocaine, and so on. And we also looked at cutting agents in the packaging. So things like paracetamol, phenocetin, caffeine, glucose, um, and packaging of different things. 
And we also looked at it for different times. So times is the amount of time you put it in adds up to a certain number of photons. So if you put it in for a long time, you can see the structure of that one. If this one's amphetamine. But we also discovered even for just a couple of seconds, only 100 photons, you can still see the same pattern there. And the piece of software we were using to look at it could look at this and see that. And that was an absolute breakthrough because in that parcel environment, we wanted stuff that you could see in a second or two seconds while it's on its conveyor belt. So we were looking at the uh, different, you can see there the uh, as we change the amount of drug and the amount of cutting agent. And so we tested it. We got it all together. We programmed um, the system to look for it and it got it right every time to an 85 to 90 percent um, success rate. And we got to publish that. So um, since that was the last thing I did before I left that facility, um, I am unsure as to where they have got with it. Uh, because when you are finding ways to uh, fight crime, you generally don't tell people when you've cracked it. Um, for <laughs> Because at that point, that was on um, a laptop bench. Um, there was a whole load of work that then needed doing to actually make it into a deployable uh, system. So after that, I moved on to the Institute of Physics, where I became a regional manager. And what does that involve? I work with lots of universities. This is a brilliant job because I get to do lots and lots of different things all the time. So I work with universities. I work with industry. There, I've actually managed to get into, um, I'm actually behind the camera. I'm the one taking the picture. Um, and I met this guy three times before I realized he was the head of Toyota Europe. He was a very nice guy and really unassuming and just wore the same industrial stuff as everyone else. So it was like two or three times before I realized who, who he was. But I was inside the main factory at Toyota, absolutely fantastic place. And I get to visit all these amazing places and meet these uh, people working in them. It's absolutely brilliant. In. Another great bit of the job is outreach. So some of you may be interested in a career in science communication. Um, and all I can say to that is the best thing to do is have a science career for a while first and then get into science communication. So we've worked with BBC One, Bango's The Theory Roadshow. We go out into physics. This was something called physics in the field. We go out to all kinds of things. We've worked in uh, Birmingham City Centre, the National Big Bang Fair, things like that. Um, even putting on our own science festival. So this is one that I co-organised up in North Derbyshire in Buxton under the largest unsupported dome in Europe. In fact, that's actually in Buxton. So when we're allowed out again, you could go and look at that. That's an interesting day out. Um, and I get to meet interesting people while I'm doing this as well. So Jim Al-Khalili has come and given a couple of lectures for us. Uh, Brian Cox, there you can see him in front of our uh, in front of our logos. He helps us out from time to time. For older people in the audience, Johnny Ball borrowed my gaffer tape. There's a heck of a uh, claim, isn't it? Uh, that's Sir Martin Rees, who is the Astronomer Royal. I took my first ever selfie with him. Um, Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell, I've worked with her a couple of times now. It's been a great privilege. She discovered the pulsar, uh, which again is a whole another set of lectures in itself. And then this guy was called Charlie Duke. You may not have heard of him. Uh, I forced him to shake my hand. He didn't want to, but I kind of made him because... He was the ninth man on the moon, or was he the eighth? He's been on the moon anyway. And so I really wanted to say that I've shaken the hand of somebody on the moon. And so he did that for me. I get to lobby MPs. So there's a lot of jobs, uh, in a lot of work in this about trying to communicate with uh, different politicians and writing press releases about those meetings. And then these press releases get into the paper. So you don't think a physicist is going to be doing these things, you know, lobbying politicians, writing press releases, getting it in the paper. But this is all stuff that you learn at university. This is stuff that you can do. And this is the kind of thing that you can get into. Regularly, people thrust weird animals into my hands. Uh, so there is a giant millipede, which had its own little spiders living on it, um, a tarantula, um, a meerkat and a skunk are all animals that I've had thrust into my hands in at work in the last 10 years. I'm also a visiting fellow at Nottingham Trent University, and as you heard at the start, a visiting senior fellow in physics and public engagement at the University of Lincoln. What does that involve? Well, it doesn't mean getting paid, unfortunately, but it does mean that you get to do lots of other cool things. So uh, at Nottingham Trent, it's specifically raised, relating to physics and forensics, so I do some teaching around uh, that kind of thing on their forensics course. 
here at the University of Lincoln um, is specifically relating to public engagement. I've only just started, but uh, I'm going to be working with Andre and some of the people there to look at how uh, we can get out into Lincolnshire and the surrounding area and uh, really get people going about physics. Uh, giving lectures, here I am, doing one right now. Um, advising on outreach and contributing to the syllabus in some ways as well. And one of the best things is, again, going in and playing with stuff. Uh, so you can uh, just, I, I don't think you can just wander in, but you know, if I ever want to uh, need a piece of equipment or anything like that, I can talk to Andre or someone and uh, we can get into it. Um, as a result, I get to go on radio shows. So I've been a guest on Material World and several local radio shows so again physics is not just sitting in a laboratory and being quiet and things you actually people it's become interesting people want to talk to you about physics and it's a great way to actually get out there um, and enjoy yourself and talk to people the whole time and uh, i write articles as well so i got into physics world that's um, the institute of physics magazine and the writing went so well that i also started fulfilling a lifelong ambition and i'm now also a science fiction writer um, so I've had two books uh, published and um, one of them has been shortlisted for the East Midlands Book Award. So now it's your turn. Um, you've been, I hope this is in some way inspiring. I don't, I know it sounds a bit like a big showing off session and I'm sorry about that. But the thing I really wanted to say was physics can get you into all kinds of places. It can get you into police chases. It can get you to international physics conferences in Las Vegas and Orlando. It can get you to Mexico. It can, one of the big secrets about a career in physics is you can travel the world at other people's expense in normal times. Um, there are no doors being closed to you if you pursue a career in physics. And I am happy to take any questions anyone has, either about the stuff that's been in this presentation or about physics careers in general. Um, last thing I must do, because I am a good scientist, uh, is put up acknowledgements and references for all of the stuff that I had in the presentation because one thing we scientists never do is steal other people's work. Okay so I will now take myself off that and I assume Andre is going to reappear as well. Thank you very much David it's really Fascinating talk, and uh, we got a discussion. Yeah, all good. I can see one question on the YouTube already. Shall I go for that one, Andre? Yes, please. please. Yeah, so Chris has asked, fantastic talk, thank you. Brilliant, thanks, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, wondering how a lot of these opportunities happen for you when it comes to public outreach. Was this just being approached by the media? Right, they're, they're different things happen at different times. So the, the outreach really started, um, well, in my first job, I was hired to talk to police officers as well. So there are lots of physicists who work there and everything like that. But the reason I got the job is because while I was at university, I was things like the president of the debating society. And I did uh, kind of drama productions and stuff like that. And they were looking for somebody specifically who could do the science, but also they could take the science to police officers, whether they be constables or chief superintendents or chief constables or whatever. I was hired to take the science to them and explain it to them which meant that when I then applied for my job with the Institute of Physics, they already knew they had somebody who could talk to non-scientists about science. And so a large part of that job became about outreach. It was about IOP initiatives that we were going out to do and talk to the public and stuff like that. And it was as a result of that, that um, places like the radio stations were at these events or the radio station, when I was on Material World, they actually wanted to talk about a new type of taser 
And so the guy who presented Material World did my media training at the Institute of Physics. So the first part of your career, if you want to get into science outreach and that kind of thing, the first part of your career is where you make all the connections and get all the experience so that when you reach the second part of your career, you can do that kind of stuff. Um, random question from Katie. How many fish do I have? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, 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 nine. There's 14 of them at the moment. Uh, it's all a bit max ma in there. If uh, I, I can only, they're all fin nippers. So the fish can only go in if they can look after themselves. So uh, anything that's kind of like uh, easily bullied no longer can live in my tank. They all have to be, uh, they have to be fairly hard fish. What would I say about doing a pure physics degree versus a physics centered natural science degree or is there not much of a difference? Not many places do, correct me if I'm wrong Andre, but I don't think many places do a natural science degree. If you go to Cambridge, you do do a natural sciences degree rather than a physics one. Um, but then you can specialize in physics afterwards. Uh, so natural sciences are generally found in very much upper tier universities um, and there is absolutely no problem with doing a physics degree or a natural science degree. Um, now that whole thing, so I did physics with medical applications. Now all the physics degrees in the country are um, accredited by the Institute of Physics. And that means that the core of the program is exactly the, well, not exactly, the, the core of the program is the same and to the same high standard at every single accredited university, okay? And then the extra bit, if you just do physics, then you can choose any kind of physics modules you want as your optional bit. But if you do physics with medical applications or physics with astronomy, then all of those optional modules are related to that subject. But having said that, if you do a core physics degree, um, you can switch. So if you do physics with astronomy, you can then do um, medical physics as a career and back and forth. So uh, I hope that kind of answers that question a bit. Can we visit local schools and inspire physics students? Well, I guess I, I, uh, I owe the, sorry, go on, Andre. No, uh, just uh, after you finish this, I'll read you a couple of questions from Padlet. Yeah, so um, if I, um, I owe some time and effort to the University of Lincoln now. So if you go to the University in Lincoln and say, we want your outreach guide to come and do something, then Andre will ask me to do it on behalf of the University of Lincoln, and then I'll be able to do it. <laughs> do you want to ask me some now, Andre? Yeah, uh, thank you everyone for questions. They arrive both in uh, uh, YouTube and uh, Padlet. Uh, there is a comment on Padlet telling, great talk. My father was a police officer around the same time as you did your research. Mm. Uh, and then there is question about exploding lasers. Isn't that also dangerous? <laughs> okay. Um, firstly, uh, great that your dad was a police officer. If that was in Lincoln, um, um, that's interesting because Lincoln was one of the five police forces that we did the trial with. So uh, Lincoln, Lincolnshire was one of the very first places in the country to get it. Uh, so the exploding lasers, uh, yeah, I amuse myself by telling people they explode, but the lasers are this big. And when they explode, they go, <laughs> and then a little thing of smoke comes out of the top of them. I think if you were using a big laser like this and it exploded, that'd be dangerous. But yes, no, it would just melt the plastic on the taser a little bit. So it's not a major problem. And there is another one. Uh, how do you train bees to find drugs? OK, uh, this wasn't my project, but I've spoken to the person whose it was. Uh, what you do, um, firstly, <clears throat> the bees are not hurt. Uh, they live longer than wild bees and they get to retire once they finish their little stint to a hive in Harrogate. So uh, they're, they're not being being cruel to. So they put into a little harness and then you give them some sugar water and they stick their tongue out to lick the sugar water. Now, if you spray them with the smell that you're looking at at the same time as giving them the sugar water, they come to associate that smell with the sugar water. So after a few minutes, when you've done this a few times, you can then take away the sugar water. And then if you swab somebody and you've trained this bee to detect um, the smell of cocaine, 
then if you swab somebody and then spray that air through in front of the bee, it goes, ooh, cocaine, sugar water, and sticks its tongue out. Uh, <laughs> the sugar water's not there anymore, but because the bee has stuck its tongue out, you know that it smelled cocaine. Uh, that I see, I see uh, one more question. Looking back, uh, 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 what, what part of physics was most interesting uh, in your career? I'm, I'm, I've always been an experimentalist. Uh, I love doing experiments. Although there was times when I was sitting there um, kind of in front of the oscilloscope for about two months thinking, I will never miss doing this. But now that I don't do frontline experiments anymore, I do miss doing them. Um, but my favorite, my favorite part of physics, it's kind of weird to say, is when it comes up against the real world. So actually working in a laboratory or in uh, the back rooms or anything like that, it's never been as interesting to me as then when I got into the front world facing part of the physics. So I used to get to go out with the police and watch them using the technology and asking them questions about how they interact with that technology. So the ergonomics, that's how, how things hold in your hand, um, how you use the radioactive seeds in brachytherapy with the people so it's all very well just using the phantom and things like that. But, but the interesting part for me is, right, how is this going to make a difference? What is this going to do? And that's the thing that uh, that really excites me, that kind of thing. Uh, th there is actually a continuation of that question about police force. Uh, the father was uh, in uh, uh, Leicester police uh, nearby. Ah, right. Uh, there is a question about politicians and physics. What politicians think about physics? Um, there sadly are very few physicists in the Houses of Parliament. Um, there are very few scientists in the Houses of Parliament. Uh, sorry, there are a lot more in the House of Lords because a lot of them get into the House of Lords because they're scientists. But a lot of it, very few MPs actually have proper full-on science degrees. Um, having said that, it's entirely possible to convince MPs that science is a good thing. And, and COVID has been horrible in so many ways. But one thing that is really done is bring to everybody's attention and politicians' attention exactly how important science is in every arena. Imagine if this entire situation had happened 15 years ago. Nobody could have worked from home and done this kind of thing in the way that we are doing now. We could not. It was taking 10 years ago, it was taking 15 years to make a vaccine. Science and technology, we're dealing with COVID and the next big thing is climate change. And science and technology is going to be at the heart of that. And I think politicians are waking up to that as a cold, hard, realistic fact. So I've got on a healthy horse now. <laughs> there, there is one more question. Would you ever go back to civil service working for the government? I would, yeah. Uh, it was actually tremendous. If you can cope with paperwork, it was actually tremendous fun. I had a whale of a time doing it. Um, the pay and conditions are excellent. If you can find a science job working for the government or a government agency, you have security of employment, you've got a very good rate of pay, and you've got a cast iron pension. Not only that, they look after you. They really do look after you in the civil service if you're a, a scientist working for them. Um, a lot of the old scientific institutions have been privatised, but there are still a fair few kicking around. And the job of government scientist is one that still certainly exists. And uh, yeah, if, so if anybody uh, is watching and wants to give me another government science job, you know, I'm listening. <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's other great areas you may not even think of. So um, there's things like um, air accident investigators, rail accident investigators, you've got everything to do with veterinary science. The health and safety executive is based in Derbyshire. Uh, so there are people um, and all the people who are now actually looking at cladding on buildings and things like that, they're engineers and physicists. Uh, and th uh, there are uh, two questions from Harry Mills in, uh, in the chat, uh, YouTube, you see yourself? Yeah. I can see one of them, which is, uh, what route should I take to follow your career? Right, the first one, <laughs> do a degree in physics. <laughs> um, so get into, if you're going to go to physics, um, A-level, again, there's a head of physics sitting in front of me, so feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, Andre. 
But to get in to do a physics degree, you need to do physics and you need to do maths A-level. This is actually really liberating because your third A-level can be pretty much anything you want. <laughs> you know, if you've got maths and physics and a good degree, and if you can have a crack at further maths as well, that is, it's, it's impressive just to do further maths. You know, even if, even if you get, come out with, say, an A in maths, but, you know, a, a B or a C in further maths, the fact that you've done the further maths, maths is important. And you're really liberated with your third A level as well if you do maths and physics and you want to do a physics degree because you can do anything as your third um, third one. Obviously, if you really want to stand out, then you do chemistry. But <laughs> uh, I did I did um, one of my secret shames, and you mustn't ever tell anyone this. I did maths. Uh, I did not do maths. I did physics, chemistry, and biology because I went to medical school. So when I transferred into doing physics at university, I had to take a remedial maths course for a year uh, when I got into it. And that is not a good way to do it. Do the A-level maths to start with. Otherwise, you're playing catch up your entire time. After that, just be ready for opportunities. When an opportunity comes along, if you see that, that first job I got, my girlfriend found it in the paper newspaper and i just I have a go at this so be ready for the opportunities when they come and take them ah harry mills is currently oh he's eight at the moment <laughs> oh sorry yeah, i'm eight and taking your gcse in math right you're already doing it um now physics is about 40 or 50 different subjects actually i mean i've been here telling you it's one subject and it's not and there are there's this whole kind of range of subjects from really, really mathsy ones. So Andre is a math. What are you, Andre? You're a theoretical physicist. Theoretical physicist. So that's a mathsy one. Maths, uh, astrophysics is also a really maths one. And then you've got people down here like me at the other end who are a bit lost in maths sometimes. But we're experimentalists. So we're the ones who actually. Uh, um, build experiments, do the experiments, and then when we run into a big maths problem, we go running to someone like Andre to come and help us out. But if, you, if you're really into maths now and already doing your GCSE, yeah, you can be, you can be paid really well to do maths for the rest of your life. <laughs> you wouldn't want to do that for a living. Ah, David Hill worked at DSTL in Farnborough. Yeah, it's a good organisation to work for, DSTL. That's fun. Ah, um, this is an interesting one from Chris. I took an English initially and then had to do a whole other physics A-level before I got it. Yeah, that's another good thing about this subject, actually. You don't have to, you, you, you can be successful in physics even if you didn't start in physics. So my, my boss in my first job uh, did an open university physics course for six years while he was working. Um, he, initially, he, he, had, he didn't even have A-levels when he started, I think. Um, and he did his physics degree while he was working. And if you if you change your mind and then want to get into physics, um, there's certainly no stigma to uh, around people who didn't start in physics. And if you if you kind of get to your mid twenties or your thirties or something like that, and suddenly think, right, I want to get into being a physicist, find an A level in maths, find an A level in physics, do them, and then either open university remote course at a university or, or get into a you know if you if you can find the money uh, to get into university then uh, just do it and then you will come out and you will get a job because physics graduates get jobs there is one more question which i think like almost to both of us where can physics link to computer science so <laughs> I, did, I just did a reply to to david that i'm a theoretical physicist but actually official my title is a bit longer i'm professor of computational and theoretical physics so in fact uh, uh, nowadays uh, uh, we not always do only by hand on paper we use computers to extreme and also supercomputers and uh, and uh, and really computation knowledge and computer science enters all together now in physics and mass and technology engineering maybe david can add from colleagues he knows yeah and um, most most 
university courses, you all university physics courses, you will be taught at least one programming language. A lot of them, you'll probably get two. You can probably get options for three or more. Um, but yeah, physicists are working throughout various industries. Uh, there are physicists working in computation in uh, supermarkets. Um, Amazon launched their new um, walk out without paying uh, shop yesterday. That's the absolute shed load of physics and mathematical stuff in there. Um, Derby is a center of computer programming. Uh, Laura Croft is from Derby. The um, uh, Candy Crush is from Derby and <laughs> things like that. There's a loads of physicists in there. Uh, physicists working all over any three dimensional shoot 'em up, Fortnite, anything like that. There's, um, they need to get the physics right. People will be able to tell if you don't get the physics right, even if they don't actually cerebrally know what's going on with that. And um, yeah, it, it, it's everywhere. Um, physicists are um, interact because often the physicists know what have a grasp of the physics problem that needs solving and then can do the computing science to deal with that. So at Lincoln, you've learned to use Python, MATLAB, Maple and C++. You know, you see, I've, I've been around so long. I was back on Fortran. I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't think that's really used for anything anymore. Yeah, uh, Harry yeah, Mills is said he did Fortran as well. There we go. <laughs> Harry Mills is asking me if it's uh, uh, would suggest to learn Java. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, uh, in 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 principle, any language you learn. Uh, it train your brain, and uh, what what we do, for instance, here in Lincoln, we don't train just one language. Uh, we have series of languages which we teach every every single year because also languages they develop, uh, and, and uh, computer languages. You know, the more you know different ones, in fact, it's better. It's similar, like the more uh, human languages you know, it's also better. Uh, uh, and uh, therefore, yeah, so don't don't be kind of be afraid that you've chosen a wrong language uh, to start with. Uh, you choose one and then will be another one and another one. Uh, similar like, you know, learning like French, German, uh, English, uh, uh, the same with computer languages. All right, I think we're kind of reaching the end, aren't we, Andre? So we... Uh, we arrive at now uh, uh, end, uh, and uh, uh, really thank you, David, uh, again for this wonderful talk. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone who participated with uh, putting questions uh, uh, in a chat and uh, putting them on uh, Padlet. Just please do remember that uh, you can still put questions in the chat kind of below of YouTube, uh, which we will look later on. Uh, you can put uh, questions uh, in reply to our blogs, and we also will look in into those. And I hope uh, you enjoyed this uh, lecture, and I do hope you might would like to come for uh, lectures next week, because uh, we still have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday two lectures every single afternoon, four till six. And so I hope to see you there, and uh, uh, I hope you enjoyed our first opening night of Lincoln Maths and Physics Week. Thank you very much, everyone. I'll go and feed my fish now. Bye. <laughs>